Welcome to Vantage Points. I am Hisham and Belidi. Today's episode is with Iron Chosky. Uh, she's a licensed mental health professional joining us from San Jose, California. By the way, today is May 9, 2020, and in New York City, in the tri state area, there was snow on the ground. May 9. I'm wearing long sleeves and I am cold. But I would like to welcome you, Iram, from the uh, Golden Coast, as they call it, and tell us about the weather there before you say anything. Thank you for having me, Hisham. And it's a beautiful, lovely afternoon. It's 12 o'clock here and it's bright and sunny. We had one of the hottest days yesterday. It went to about 103 degrees yesterday. So today we're seeing sunny and highs of like 90. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad somebody's enjoying the weather. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you're a licensed mental health professional. That's what I said. But your actual title is uh, uh, ended with the acronym LMFT. So the first thing I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that acronym means. And I came up with the following. It's licensed mental frosting technician. Is <laughs> So what does the acronym actually state, or what is it for? I really like your worship, Hisham, but it's uh, not as fancy. It means a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist. Okay, very good. So we have so many uh, different acronyms in the mental health field, but you know what? Maybe mental frosting is not a bad thing. You know, you're adding frosting to the, you know, anxieties and stuff, so it, it might help in coping. <laughs> Absolutely. You need a little mental frosting to make sense of the world. Very good. So uh, tell me a little bit first about those different uh, titles in the mental health profession. What do they mean? Uh, like, for example, we know there is a psychiatrist and there is a psychologist and there is a therapist. So tell us the difference and, and give us a little bit uh, of the meaning of each. Sure. So you will come across a broad spectrum of different licenses. There is definitely psychiatry and psychiatrists. So those are the people that um, prescribe medication to you. Okay? And um, then you also have uh, psychologists and you have LCSWs and you have LMFTs. And this is the wide range of people who can do mental health um, therapy with you. So it's also psychotherapy, you'll hear mental health therapy, talk therapy. And this is when, when you're having any issues with um, stress, anxiety, relationships, depression, any of the psychological issues, um, you'll be able to meet any of these folks and they will be able to do talk therapy or psychotherapy. They will not be able to prescribe any kind of medications. Sometimes that's better for you. I, I mean, I, I don't use medications unless I really have to. Uh, I came from a culture that they can go themselves to the uh, pharmacy and order an antibiotic because they got a stomach ache or whatever. Um, I see the overuse of medication, so I am very cautious um, what to put in my body. So that's, that's not a bad thing. So, okay, so you talked about family therapy. Um, and in the time that we're... Uh, going through right now with the COVID-19 and the lockdown and everything else. Um, tell us, I mean, I, I wanted to do this episode and this will be one of many with mental health professionals uh, that will be one of the staples of the show uh, moving forward. Um, tell us a few things about uh, how to cope with the current situation. And then later on, I would like to talk about the religious community um, from, from any background, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a Muslim and I'm unable to go to the mosque at, in, in the month of Ramadan, which is the kind of the big season of the year uh, to be at the mosque with the community. So first, let's talk about in general coping mechanisms, and then we'll talk about the religious communities uh, in the rest of the show. Yeah. So, you know, right now with our current pandemic and shelter in place, a lot of people are feeling very kind of cooped up. They may be feeling very stressed out, frustrated, financially strapped, and they may be feeling, you know, how, how do we just get out of this and what do we do to cope with this situation? So I've come up with maybe just some easy, very simple, practical strategies that you can 
just do at any place, anywhere. Um, and the first one I'm thinking about is just checking in with friends and family. Um, you know, to reduce that isolation that a lot of people may be going through right now is um, to realize that the shelter in place is not meant to make us feel isolated from our loved ones. Um, so really using video platforms such as Zoom or um, staying connected on uh, WhatsApp and just checking in via phone and really making that a routine and making that a habit is very helpful. Um, my second point is that, you know, try to have a routine, one that is helping you stay an understanding of this new sort of a normal now and finding time to engage in um, creative activities, um, things like just something relaxing for you, whether it's cooking, spending time gardening. So doing something relaxing and spreading that out throughout your day can be very helpful. Um, maybe even limiting exposure to certain news channels and social media um, and just maybe allocating a certain amount of time every day um, can reduce that overexposure to some very worry provoking news and that can help to prevent stress and anxiety. And this is a great time to improve your self-care, right? Especially self-care at this time is very, very important. So promoting that adequate restful sleep, having healthy meals on time, um, and some physical activities can be just very beneficial at this time. Oh, I'm getting maybe, my naps. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm no, like crazy these days. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think even, you know, kind of partaking in some uh, physical activities, whether it's just even a simple little activity like going out and taking a little walk can be very helpful. Um, and then just making sure that, you know, you're evaluating things from the past that helped you out. So maybe taking a glimpse into past things that have helped you in this kind of a situation, whether it's um, you know, prayer, making sure that you're cooking, whether it's uh, reading a good book, making sure that you're, you're taking the time to do some enjoyable activity. Um, and my last tip is just really staying positive, right? Realizing that this is temporary, it's not gonna last forever. Um, and just kind of looking out in, into the future and knowing that we will all make it. So these are very good tips. And I heard you talking about staying away from um, watching news and, and being hooked basically to the uh, tube. Um, and I'm noticing this that like, I was glued to the TV screens watching news nonstop in the first couple of weeks. And it was really exhausting and it increased my stress level and, and other things. Is this a special, um, like uh, for, for this special time only, or that's an advice that you would make uh, in all the times as a general advice? You know, I think especially at this time, Right, really kind of not engaging in this uh, very stressful and very provoking news can be helpful. But even in general, kind of, you know, allowing yourself just a, a specific amount of time. That, okay, I'm going to spend maybe 40 minutes or 50 minutes of my day updating myself about, you know, what's happening in this world or what's happening with the virus can be beneficial because otherwise it can be a lot of news and there's a new headline literally every few minutes. And that can be very, very provoking. I mean, CNN made its business that the word breaking news is just there on the screen 24 seven. That right. is right. stress inducing in itself. And it's this bright, bold red and like it, it's really, um, it, it, it takes a toll on your uh, health and, and stress level after a while. Uh, especially when you're hearing Wolf Blitzer's voice saying it, <laughs> it's unbelievable. So. I, I want to address maybe um, the, the, the concept of mental health, um, because a lot of people say, especially from cultures um, like in the Eastern cultures, say, oh, I'm not crazy. I don't need uh, health. Yeah, I might be sad or whatever, but it's going to go away. What, what is the concept of mental health and how would you explain it to people who are uh, apprehensive to uh, going for therapy? And that is such a great question because I come from a culture where you we're know, talking about mental health and talking about anything related with uh, anything to do with any psychological disorders is such a taboo. Um, it's, it's considered just kind of hocus pocus. 
a lot of people say some things like, you know, snap out of it, or you can, you know, you can fix it, you got to fix yourself. And those are things that are very um, stigmatizing and, and very uh, worrying for a lot of people, because that's what we're trying to break away from. So um, when somebody does have these questions, and uh, really a clinical depression or is this really sadness I often tell them to think about their symptoms in light of how long have they been feeling All right so if it's sadness that's very normal all of us go through these um, ups and downs and highs and lows of our mood and uh, life circumstances evolve and we are able to respond in different ways um, but with clinical depression it's sort of more prolonged you have this sense of dread, you have this self-loathing. Um, a lot of men especially also go through anger and irritability because they're afraid of showing um, this sort of a state of weakness, right? In, uh, in a lot of uh, cultures, uh, in the Pakistani and Indian culture, for example, um, there is this saying where, you know, uh, you've got to keep your face. You can't, you can't just, you know, show the society um, your weaknesses, right? And it's, it's very taboo for young men and, and boys and people to just come out and say that this is what I'm feeling and this is what's happening. So a lot of times they minimize the symptoms and they often think that, hey, if I'm a guy, this is normal. I can't talk about all of this. This is girly stuff. Okay, so tell us more about the difference between depression and just regular sadness. And, and what is regular sadness to begin with? And um, that's a fantastic question, Hisham. Um, so again, sadness is just normal. It's, it's what we all experience and people go through these periods of feeling sad, especially after experiencing a loss or you know, during and after a stressful period um, like our current shelter in place. But clinical depression is more constant. So the sad or the empty feeling does not quite go away. And even after a couple of weeks, it's kind of everyday activities that we're kind of routine become a struggle for the person to accomplish. So everyday routines like um, eating, sleeping, working, and socializing are heavily impacted. Um, it's not necessary for a person suffering from depression to just have all of the symptoms that I'm gonna talk about, but sufferers of depression usually experience um, an increase or a decrease in their appetite, um, which is sometimes even included with uh, weight fluctuations. So the person may notice that their weight keeps switching over. Um, there is this empty or numb feeling where you just don't feel like you're able to enjoy people around you or any activities um, that you're partaking in. There is an overarching feeling of hopelessness and this pessimism. Um, the person can experience a lot of that self-loathing. It's like almost being tied to a person that you just really dislike. Um, they also may be feeling things like um, experiencing difficulty concentrating, um, remembering things, or making wise decisions, feeling restless or having trouble sitting still, um, a lot of feelings of guilt and worthlessness. And if uh, depression goes untreated, it can even involve um, symptoms like having thoughts of death or suicide or suicide attempts. Hmm. So any one of us who had been uh, in depression or uh, suffering from it or a family member can actually recognize, uh, I've known family members who um, were thinking well, like, they don't wanna be alive, not necessarily hurting themselves, wanna hurt themselves, but they loathe the situation so much that they prefer to die. So can you tell us more about this? What is the best approach for the person feeling this? and the people around them, family, friends. Absolutely. And you know, um, the first easy approach to, if you feel like you have any concerns, if you feel like, hey, you know, the symptoms that Iram mentioned kind of resonate with me, and I'm, I'm seeing that I feel, you know, persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness or pessimism, and I can't enjoy regular daily activities with my friends and I'm isolating myself from family members or I'm sleeping too much or too little. If any of these things are resonating with you and if you're nodding your head to any of these things and you feel like, hey, there's something amiss. I feel like I have, it's been far too long where I've not been able to enjoy myself or it's been far too long where I've been able to not concentrate or my eating is, is 
something is off. I can notice that my appetite is not the same as it used to be. It's time to pick up that phone and it's time to get in touch with a mental health professional, right? And a lot of times, uh, a lot of mental health professionals do a consultation. Um, so the first time when you talk to a person for 15, 20 minutes, they usually do this just free of charge. And during the COVID-19 situation, um, I'm actually offering free mental health sort of a support for our community. And it's uh, in California where I can uh, just see all the people um, because my license kind of caps me into just being able to see only people in California. Um, but I would be more than happy to also, if you're calling from New York or wherever, to help you find that resource and that referral support system where you'll be able to talk with a licensed mental health person to help you know that, hey, is this truly clinical depression? And there are several things that you can do. And the first thing that I think you can do is uh, psychotherapy. So there's cognitive behavioral therapy. There are tons of different therapies out there. And the family can also be very supportive. Um, there's also family therapy. So the family is actually, I've noticed with people that I work, when there's a uh, family support, the person feels a lot more engaged in treatment and they're able to do a lot better. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. And I know that in, in New York where I am, uh, there has been uh, also a lot of talk about this and they established a hotline for people who are uh, having these feelings so they can call. I'm going to put uh, those numbers and links in uh, the uh, under the video on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Um, so let's say that someone having these feelings and gave you a call and you, uh, you can determine, like you can diagnose the situation, wh whether it's, for example, regular sadness versus anxiety versus depression, if there is a meaningful difference between those things, is that? Yes. So if the person were to call, um, so what basically a therapist would do in the beginning of, um, kind of seeing a new person is an assessment. So assessing, you know, what kind of symptoms you're coming in with, why you've chosen to come in uh, for therapy at this time, whether you have any other stressors in your life. So really keeping account of, you know, your, your family history, um, your psychological symptoms, um, what kind of uh, life stressors and external circumstances have kind of been placed right now, um, and really taking it from there. And then they devise a treatment plan. So that's something that's collaborated with the person and the mental health professional. And um, they kind of figure out, okay, so if, if you have depression, you know, how do we manage these things, right? What are some of the goals that we can build together? Excellent. So <clears throat> is it an auto, if somebody is depressed, is it an automatic uh, prescription? Like they have to go to a psychiatrist and be under medications, especially with what we hear about the side effects of many of those uh, psychological medications? So it um, really depends, Hisham, on the person and their circumstances and the severity of you know, their symptoms, right? So if, if the person is just feeling maybe because of what we're going through the pandemic, and a lot of um, kids and parents are feeling all the stress of you know, kind of being removed from society and now having to deal with all these stressors it's kind of put on them. So it really depends on the kind of circumstances that they're dealing with. Like frontline workers right now are having to deal with a lot of stressors involved in their jobs and maybe even seeing people in front of their eyes literally passing by and, and not being able to, you know, feeling kind of helpless and not being able to help as much. So seeing these near-death experiences or possibly even experiences and, and seeing somebody dying in front of you can be very traumatizing. Right, so the person may be even suffering from what we call PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and if, if that continues, it can kind of, you know, there's a lot of overlap. So there's depression, there's anxiety, there's post-traumatic stress disorder. So really just kind of conveying these symptoms and talking to somebody can be that first step. And really knowing how severe your symptoms are, depending on that, the, the professional will tell you and guide you whether or not you need um, that additional service of getting maybe uh, some medications. And that's not always a necessity, but maybe if the symptoms are severe enough, it always helps to have you know, two things going and um, kind of dealing with that. Okay, so at least we know that if you call a mental health professional, it doesn't mean they're gonna grab you and put you in 
a, a hospital bed as a crazy person. Every one of us is under a lot of stress, especially now under this lockdown and the fear of catching that disease or what you're going to do or loss your income if you lost your income in, in this time. So seek help if you, um, if you need it, if you feel sad, if you feel depressed, seek help. There are so many resources and each state has its own um, helpline for that uh, regard. If you just joined us, we are speaking with Iram Chosky. Um, um, uh, she's a licensed mental health professional joining us from San Jose, California. So Iram, uh, let's talk now about those who uh, lost their income at this time and uh, compounding and adding to the stressors that uh, they are feeling from the lockdown. What would be the message to those people and like, they can't do anything for the time being about that income, but what would you say to them? Um, first of all, I, you know, there's, there's only so much that words can convey. And, you know, the pain and the suffering that has come with uh, the current pandemic from people losing their jobs to people having to really understand how to work around our system and having to wait for their stimulus checks to having to go and find new employment. There's a lot of stress in your life and know that there is help available, there's support available. And there's a lot of mental health um, services out there. Please know that there will be information available. I know Hisham said that he's going to be linking a lot of different resources down here. Um, but please reach out. Um, you can visit my website. It's www.iremchoksy.com. That's iremchoksy.com. And um, I try my best to have blogs up um, every week. And know that there, there's definitely ways for you to cope with this and stay positive, you know, as best as you can. Um, know that things are going to change for the better. Excellent. Can you repeat the website again, please? Sure. It's www.iremchoksy.com. That's iremchoksy.com. Excellent. Thank you very much. So now let's talk about um, the religious communities. So we, we are both Muslims and we are um, unable at this time to go to the mosque in the most uh, beautiful time of the year for us to gather. Um, like uh, growing up in Egypt, um, we used to be together almost every day at the mosque or at a, a friend's house or a family relative or this and that sharing the iftar, the dinner meal after fasting the entire day, uh, the familial feelings, the community feeling, uh, potluck or not, and then going to the mosque for the spiritual part, uh, the prayers of the night and, and getting this uh, recharged for the rest of the year uh, for that time. And this doesn't only apply to Muslims, any religious community uh, stop. Jews stop going to synagogues, Christians stop going to churches, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, everybody is now unfortunately under this uh, lockdown. So how do you uh, cope with something like that? Um, and what's your message to the religious communities? You know, when I think about how uh, Aramdan is going without that spiritual aspect of being able to connect with our community, it can be very stressful for people. And like you mentioned, it's, it's the most beautiful month of the year and everybody's been waiting for this. But my, my message around that would be to really find ways of expressing kindness and patience and compassion, the things that Islam stands for, and uh, try to find that in everyday activity. Really stay connected with um, your spirituality. Make sure that you're still doing all the things that make Ramadan beautiful, right? Stay connected with your family, making sure that you're still enjoying that beautiful meal at the end of the day. And really showing that kindness and compassion and respect to each other, um, be it whether you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whatever you are, um, really show that love and kindness to also just extending it out to your neighbors. So I had this uh, beautiful example that my mom gave me just a, a couple of weeks ago. 
And she said, before Ramadan started, she uh, went with my dad and knocked on the doors of our neighbors with their masks and trying to you know, keep that social distance in mind. But with uh, uh, a lot of masjul dates, and, and holding that box in front of them and saying, you know, we are your neighbors and this is Ramadan, it's our holy month. And we just wanted to come over and say who we are and we want to stay connected with you. If there's anything that's going on in your lives, if you want to stay and reach out, we live right over here. And I thought that, that was so beautiful for her to do that. And it gave me an idea about, hey, what can I do for my neighborhood? What can I do for my community? And that's when I, I thought, okay, let's Let's create this sort of a support system for people who are maybe financially strapped and not knowing where to go and having the stigma about mental health. And let's provide them maybe after hours care because I have a full-time day job. So I wanted to do something for our community, which was showcasing that, that spirit of compassion and that spirit of respect. So really allow yourself to just go out there and do something of kindness and compassion. That's beautiful, and uh, I know a lot of people who actually do this. They bake uh, the whatever cookies or special desserts or food from uh, their culture and share it with their neighbors at this time, and that's one of the best ways to connect. And I, I, I dislike the term social distancing, and I heard someone saying it's physical distancing but keeping the social connection still there, and, and I like that very much. Um, the last question I want to ask you is about children. Um, what is your advice to parents uh, and family of young children who this is happening for the first time in their lives, hopefully the last time, uh, but they're under that stress, how to cope, what to do in order not to, at the very least, be very bored and, and you know, creating friction at home or whatnot? What would you be your advice? Um, first off, kudos to parents. And if you're a mother watching, uh, happy Mother's Day. Um, again, you are doing such an amazing job. Let me first say that to you as a, a father or a mother or an aunt, who you are and where you're watching this from, you're doing an amazing job. It's, it's, I can only imagine how stressful it is to have a kid or two or multiple kids and having to really make sure that they're still keeping up with their studying, make sure that they're still sleeping on time, eating on time, and, and still maintaining your own sanity in all of this. So um, know that you're doing a fantastic job and, and this is you know trying times, things that have not really been experimented or thought of before and we're all living this. Um, some things that you can think about are just the thing that you would think for yourself, really having that routine also for your kids. Right, so making sure that even though they're not going to school, making sure that they're waking up on time, making sure that they're getting kind of dressed for the day, making sure that they're having healthy meals, sleeping on time, making sure that they're also um, staying socially connected with you and maybe their peers in some way. Right, so uh, it could be through uh, uh, you know a Zoom activity, it could be even going out for a little bit and doing certain activities like gardening. Right? Um, giving them a little bit of that freedom to still go out because they're kids, they need to kind of get out there and then um, go and spend and expend their energy. So really allowing that little bit of uh, moment where they're able to do other things and giving yourself also some calm time, right? Allowing yourself to realize that kids are sometimes just going to be kids and um, allowing them that freedom of maybe an hour to do what they like. Um, I sometimes think that video games are not that bad. They can be a uh, a helpful resource uh, when you need a little break from your kids. Excellent. Iram Choksi, I want to thank you very much for joining us today to give us your insights on how to cope under this difficult time. I hope this will be one of many other times. And uh, enjoy the weather in uh, San Jose, California. There are flurries going down right now here in New York. And I uh, envy you with love. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Hisham. And I wish I could show you butterflies and beautiful spring flowers, but it's beautiful blue skies here. So inshallah, that this good weather is coming your way soon. Inshallah. Ramadan Kareem to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our episode today with Iron Chosky. Choksi, I'm sorry, a licensed mental health professional joining us from San Jose, California. Uh, uh, join us next time where we're going to be talking about how to deal with the post-Ramadan uh, uh, 
you know, atmosphere still being held in place because most governors are announcing, uh, some governors are announcing reopening, but other governors are still having a, uh, us in lockdown. So we'll talk more about these issues in the coming weeks moving forward, inshallah. Thank you for joining Vantage Points. There are hashtags and there is a hashtag. This is the hashtag. Take care, Amrik.